Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, director of the Alabama Center for the Book. The Alabama Center is an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book in Washington, D.C. The mission of the state affiliates is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy, with a special emphasis on promoting the unique literary heritage of each state or territory. The authors in this video are from the Central Two region, comprised of a group of contiguous Midwestern and Southern states of the United States. Their books were chosen by the affiliate centers for the book to represent their state's literary heritage. These so-called great reads from great places are chosen every year by the affiliate centers. You can see the entire list from this year and preceding years by visiting www.loc.gov backslash programs. Select the Center for the Book and then the Great Reads from Great Places link. The affiliates of the Central Two region decided to ask their authors two questions. The first question is, the theme of this year's festival is everyone has a story. Tell us a little bit about your story and what inspired you to start writing. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Duffield and I'm the author of the book House Finds a Home, uh, illustrated by Jen Carace. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you for having me, and I'd like to say that I'm honored uh, to have my book included on the festival list. Um, so I was born and raised in Arkansas, and with the exception of about five years, I've lived here all my life. Um, I love walking and hiking, biking, camping, anything really that takes me outside and connects me with nature. And the beauty of Arkansas, the state of Arkansas is just the perfect setting for that. Uh, reading has always been a really big part of my life. Uh, so if I'm out camping or under a tree somewhere with a good book, all is right with my world. Um, <clears throat> when I was in second grade, our school library opened once a week during the summer for book checkouts. And that was just like heaven for me. Uh, and that same summer, I set a goal and I decided I'm going to read every single book in the library. And as you can guess, that did not happen. Uh, but I have to say, I, I put forth a valiant effort. I, I really tried. Um, and then maybe when I was around 12 or 13, I discovered another fabulous summer book surprise. And that was the bookmobile. I will never forget sweating my way up this big hill from our house where we lived up to a parking lot, um, um, I don't know, maybe a mile away, and spotting the blue and yellow bookmobile sitting there. Um, I still remember the feeling of climbing up those steps and getting blasted with freezing cold air-conditioned air as I walked in, and then seeing all those books lining each side of the bus and knowing that I'd get to take some home. That's, that was a true delight for me. So I wanted to say for any librarians who might be listening, your efforts do make a difference in children's lives. Um, all those books that I read and those that I continue to read um, bring so much joy to my life. And I began to wonder if I could bring that happiness to others with my words. And um, even as an adult, I, I read books written for adults, but I've always had a special place and I really loved children's books from picture books to middle grade novels, to even to YA. So it made sense that what I love to read is also what I wanted to write. Um, but to sort of, sort of ease my way in, I first started writing for children's magazines. And then later I began focusing on the book market and, um, Within children's books, picture books were always that sweet spot for me. They were what I most wanted to write. Um, I think picture books are such a wonderful collaboration uh, between the writer and the illustrator. And in my eyes, they're these perfect little handheld works of art that children and parents get to share. Um, I've been consistently blessed with amazingly talented illustrators who've created the art for the books that I've written. Um, the illustrations just add another layer to the words. And I think picture books would only be a shell of a story without them. So a big thank you to all the hardworking illustrators out there. 
Um, I write both fiction and nonfiction. I love stories, uh, but I also enjoy the research process and learning new things. And um, I love how writing lets me explore new topics and I ideas. Um, as a nature lover, my nonfiction often deals with animals and nature, uh, but I've also written several biographies for young readers, and that's something else that I enjoy too. Um, the children's trade book market can be a tough market to break into, but I kept learning and kept working and kept writing, and now 20-something years later, I'm the author of more than 40 books for children. Hi, uh, my name is Kathleen Wilford, and my great book from Great Places is called Cabby Pots, Duchess of Dirt, <laughs> from the great state of Kansas. Nicole and I'm, I'm really happy to be interviewed today. And my personal story um, begins with my family moving around a lot. So I put stars here in all the different places that I've lived. Um, Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia, New Orleans, upstate New York and New Jersey. And I've lived um, a lot of different places, uh, but never actually in Kansas. <laughs> so um, where I live now in New Jersey, it's pretty um, hilly and lots of trees, so not a whole lot like Kansas. Um, growing up, um, you can see that um, I've always loved to read. It might be partly because we moved so much and partly because my parents encouraged it and partly because we didn't have a TV until I was 10 years old, so I had nothing else to do. Um, but I grew up with a passion for reading and, um, you know, that was what I spent a lot of time doing. Um, you can, you hear of a lot of authors who, um, oh, let me show you next also, that I loved books about the prairie when I was growing up. I had no idea at the time that that was going to lead to writing a book set in Kansas. But these are some of the books that I loved as a child and also as an adult. Um, I would, I loved all kinds of books, actually, and I would pretty much clear out the shelves of the children's library wherever we lived, um, going shelf by shelf. And so I'm very grateful to librarians. So um, thank you, Nicole, and other librarians for, um, you know, encouraging kids like me. Um, all right, so um, you hear about a lot of writers who come to writing by indirect means like they're chemists you know or astrophysicists or whatever but in my case it's kind of more of a straight line um, in the sense that um, I was an English major in college and studied literature in grad school and then I taught English and language arts um, in middle school and high school and right now I teach here. Um, this is Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey. And I teach there now, um, I teach writing. Um, so in spite of this, uh, what would be considered great preparation <laughs> to be a writer, I and I always wanted to be a writer, I kind of never pursued it. And I had an awe for writers and also a strong case of self-doubt. So I never really thought I could do it. But a friend of mine invited me to join a critique group um, as part of SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And um, on a whim, I just joined, even though I didn't have anything <laughs> actually to critique at that time. And by the way, I would advise any, you know, aspiring writers to join a community like that, you know, for the encouragement and um, the accountability and the shoulder to cry on sometimes. Um, it was great for me. Um, the line between um, joining that group and um, getting this book published was kind of a long one, um, but it's been super fun along the way. My name is Frank X. Walker, and I'm here today because of uh, my first children's book, A is for Afrolatcha. And my story in a nutshell is that uh, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, I'm a poet, and this is my first children's book, which I'm very excited about. Um, and I hope 
being that people will come to it and appreciate of how useful it is for people who don't consider themselves children. My name is Sarah Guillory, and I'm the author of Nowhere Better Than Here, which is a middle grade novel. Um, and I figure that my story of how I got into writing is like most authors' stories of how they get into writing, is that I was a reader first. I fell in love with reading before I even started school. I come from a family of teachers, and my grandmother taught me to read before I started kindergarten. So first, green eggs and ham. I was a green egg and green eggs and ham fan uh, from the get go. So I was a pretty um, obedient, well behaved, one of those firstborn daughters kind of uh, of children. But the one thing I used to get in trouble at school, uh, elementary school for, was rushing through my work so that I could read. Um, so yeah, I became a reader first, and I think anybody who loves reading wants to know, hey, I wonder if I could do that. Maybe I would like to try that. So I wrote a book. Um, when I was about nine for um, a gifted and talented program where they would, it was some kind of contest and we had to write and illustrate our own book. And it was about some country cats who got lost in the city. So it was sort of like an aristocrats uh, spinoff thing. And I can't draw and the illustrations were bad and the story was bad and I did not win. And so I thought I could never be a writer. I thought that great writers were all prodigies. I thought that Shakespeare was doing his iambic pentameter in elementary school and that if I wasn't, I could never be a writer. So it really wasn't until my 20s that I gave myself permission to pursue writing and publishing because I was sort of um, embarrassed to tell people that I wanted to be a writer because I knew I wasn't good yet. Um, so in my 20s, I kind of grew up enough to realize like, hey, you can do this even if you're not very good at it. And lo and behold, the more I did it, the better I got. Um, so yeah, I think I really started writing seriously in my 20s when I was teaching school um, during the day and then writing in the evenings. My name is Michael W. Waters, and I'm the author of Liberty's Civil Rights Road Trip. About 20 years ago, I had the privilege of starting a civil rights pilgrimage to take persons through the Deep South, uh, to cities and sites significant to the civil rights movement. I have loved history since I was a young boy. I come from a family of storytellers who wove in our family story into the nation's story. And so anyone who knows me knows my passion, not only of history, but of understanding the impacts that history continues to play on present day and also to share that history with young people. And so um, that's what inspires me, the opportunity not only to learn more about our history, but also to uncover, to investigate the ways in which history is still very present with us. And frankly, to discern what we must do in present day in order to make for a better future. So my name is Coulter Jackson and my book is The Rhino Suit. Um, and I guess my story, um, when I was five years old, um, I had the good fortune of living behind the Sedalia Public Library, and um, there were no books in our home, but um, my brother and I were these scrappy kids, and we were playing in the yard of the library, and the librarian came outside, and um, she brought me inside, and she showed me the children's library, and she gave me a library card, even though I was only five years old, and I feel like that very specific moment is the thing that changed and altered the course of my entire life because I quickly understood that that library card gave me access to all these worlds of books. And every time you opened one, it was like a new world. So it opened the world to me. And I feel like I shaped my whole life around, um, around books and getting around book people. Like um, I studied journalism at the University of Missouri and then I left for New York um, because every time you open a book, the first thing it says inside is New York. So I thought that's where the book people were. So I went to New York, I worked in advertising, I worked as a speech writer. I did a lot of different things until I figured out that people actually make books and write books. <laughs> and so then I tried my hand at that and it took me a couple of years, um, but, but that, that started to work out for me. So um, that's 
that was my love. That's where my love of books started. Um, and, and that's where it's led me so far. Well, hi, I am Tammy Sauer. I am the author of Mary Had a Little Plan, and I'm from Oklahoma. Well, I grew up on a farm in Kansas, and I've always been a big reader, but I never knew that I would could, could or would become an author. I never really thought of authors as real people. My plan was to be a third grade teacher. So I went to Kansas State University. I got my degree in elementary education because I was going to be a third grade teacher. But my senior year of college, something happened to me. I had the best teacher of my life. Her name is Dr. Marjorie Hancock. And in her class, she had us do lots of reading and writing. Well, one day after class, Dr. Marjorie Hancock pulled me aside and she said, Tammy, you have a gift with words. You should pursue publication. And knowing that my favorite teacher believed in me, that really helped me to believe in myself. But I didn't get serious about writing right away. I would write for a few days, then I would stop for a week, and then I would write for a month, and then I would stop for a year. It just wasn't a priority in my life. Plus, I became a teacher. I was a library media specialist. I became a mom, so I was really busy. Well, when my daughter was in preschool, there was an illustrator who visited her class. And when I saw someone who was in the business, that really made my heart pound. And it made me feel like I really need to be in this business too. So after her, after I dropped her off that day, I went straight to Barnes and Noble. I bought a book called The Children's Writers and Illustrators Market Guide. And I decided that day that I was going to finally pursue publication. So I decided during my kids' nap time, I have two children. They're now 25 and 23. But when they were little, I got them to simultaneously nap, which is probably my best accomplishment as a human being. And for those two hours every day, I decided I wasn't going to talk on the phone. I wasn't going to clean the house. I wasn't going to read a magazine. During those two hours every single day, I was going to try to figure out how to write books for kids. And so I proceeded to write some really, really bad stories but I started to get a little bit better. And a year after I began all of this, we got a knock on our door one evening. Well, the kids were very small at this time. And my husband and I, we had we had already tucked our baby Mason into bed and we had tucked our three-year-old daughter into bed. And then we heard this knock and neither one of us was expecting anybody. And we went to the door, we opened it up and there was a kid standing there. He looked like he was probably a fifth grader. And he said, hi, I'm selling newspaper subscriptions. I'm trying to raise some money. I want to go to cowboy camp. Well, this kid, he didn't look like a cowboy. He didn't act like a cowboy. He didn't walk like a cowboy or talk like a cowboy. And at first I thought, ooh, I hope he'll be okay when he goes to cowboy camp. And then I thought, ooh, that's a great idea for a book. So I wrote a book about a kid named Avery. He goes to cowboy camp. He doesn't fit in. He doesn't do anything right, but he ends up being the hero at cowboy camp anyway. So cowboy camp was my very first book. Since then, I've written a lot more. Right now, I have 36 published books, and I have more books on the way. Hi, I'm Ruta Sepetis, the author of I Must Betray You, and I am Lithuanian American. And what inspired me to begin writing uh, was to share the history and story of the country that my father was from and fled from. And that led to my book, Between Shades of Grey, my debut novel. And when that was released, uh, suddenly the world was less lonely. I met so many other Lithuanians and so many other people that had fled from countries during World War II. And I realized the power of sharing our stories. The second question that the Central Two affiliates had for their authors was, what is your Great Reads from Great Places book about and how do you and or your work connect to the state that selected it? Uh, my picture book, as I mentioned, is House Finds a Home, uh, and it's actually told from the point of view of a house. A house is the main character, and it's about a house who has a problem. Uh, his longtime inhabitants move out and leave him lonely. Um, over the years, new owners move in, and they make house their home in their own individual ways, but those owners, too, eventually move on. But as generations pass and as life changes around him, 
House experiences new traditions uh, and new people, and he learns that love can come in many forms. Um, and one of my favorite parts is at the end, uh, if you look closely at the art, uh, as I mentioned, created by the fabulous Jen Carace, uh, you'll see a familiar, although much older face in the pictures. Uh, the little girl who originally lived in the house is now a grandmother who's moving back into house uh, with her daughter, her granddaughter, and the rest of her family. So it's kind of a nice a nice full circle ending from the beginning. She starts out as the the young girl in the the original child at the house, and then she moves back in as as the grandmother with her family. So that's kind of a that's kind of a fun thing to look for. Um, and my the little tagline I use for the book is "Home is where the love is," because it doesn't matter who or where you are, as long as the love's there, home's there. Um, so the idea for the book stemmed from my childhood home here in Arkansas. Uh, the house was my mom's pride and joy. Uh, she lived there for like 50 years and was forever working on it. Um, she was always doing projects, um, fixing something, painting something, planting something, and even climbing on the roof when she was in her 70s and maybe even her 80s. But but that's just who she was. Um so I lost my mom in 2015, and a while after that, I decided to drive by her house. Um, the house had another owner at that point, uh, but in my mind, it'll always be mom's house. And I'll admit, I cried sitting in the parking lot across the street, looking at the house's peeling paint, the unclipped shrubs, and a screen hanging partway off one window. Uh, the house looked really sad to me, and I thought, the house is sad without my mom. Um, I'm sure the new owner was doing his or her best, but and but it just wasn't the same as how mom would have done it. Um, and right at that moment, the first line of the book, and I mean, at this point, it was a book that I didn't even know I was going to write. This line, first line just popped into my head, and that line was, <clears throat> you may think houses don't have hearts but house had one and it was broken. And that's a pretty sad beginning, um, but that's what I was feeling at the moment. And picture books often start with the problem. So I thought, I thought it would work. Uh, I just had to figure out a way to make house's story hopeful. And, and hopefully that's what I did. Um, I will say that first lines don't always come that easily for me. And, and because of that, Part of me feels like that was a special gift from my mom on that day. Um, I dedicated the book to my mom, my dad, my brother, and my sister, and also to 1519, which is the house number of my childhood home. And I hope that the book is a good way to honor my mom and to give a nod to the house who helped me make me the person that I am today and the writer that I am today. Well, pretty directly, because my um, story is set in Kansas in 1875, which is the year after a particularly terrible grasshopper infestation that basically decimated the whole state and all of the crops. And my um, protagonist, Tabby Potts, is a 12-year-old girl who lives in a sod house. Uh, when I show pictures like this to people in New Jersey, they don't even know what this is. Because uh, New Jersey has plenty of trees to uh, build houses out of, so they're like totally unfamiliar with the concept, but I guess people in Kansas um, are pretty familiar. Um, so I love these pictures. This is one I think is great, these people up on their roof having like orchestra practice or something. Um, but Cabby um, is a 12-year-old homesteader. As I say, she lives in a sod house. Her family is um, pretty hard up after the grasshoppers. Um, and she is an outdoor kind of girl. You know, she she would rather be hoeing the cornfield or milking the cow than doing stuff indoors. And she has, which is going to get her into trouble, what her ma calls an intemperate tongue, which you could also call a big mouth. <laughs> um, but to establish her voice, what I did here was this is the first couple sentences of the book. Um, so let me just read these. Um, 
So skunk fat says right here, it's just the thing for greasing your boots or rubbing on sores. I held up the newest edition of Prairie Farmer for my sister Emmeline to see in case she didn't believe it. So this scene is set in the post office of the town where Emmeline is the postmistress and Cabby is helping her on this particular day. And they are interrupted by a knock on the door. Um, and it turns out that Cabby's parents are looking for her because they want her to go work as a housemaid in a grand English manor about 15 miles down the railroad line from their house. Um, so that you can see on the front cover of the book, a picture of how the artist envisioned the house. Um, this is a picture of what I actually modeled the house on. There actually was a settlement of British aristocrats on the plains of Kansas um, in the town of Victoria, Kansas. And George Grant, um, the guy who built this house, um, founded this settlement. And he envisioned it as a community of culture and refinement for the younger sons of the British nobility. And they came over with all of their fine furniture and their fine clothes and their fancy ways. Um, and in fact, when Cabby arrives at the house, if you can see the house in the background, she she thinks that is the house <laughs> and doesn't realize that a fancy building like that could be a stable for horses. But anyway, she is horrified at the thought of working at moving away from home, which, she, which she's never done, working in a place like this. Um, and indeed, it is very stifling for her. The, the mistress of the house, Lady Ashford, um, treats her as a servant. And Cabby's always getting in trouble with the housekeeper, Mrs. Shaw. And she's always getting in fights with the other only other kid on this place, who's um, a boy who's half Kiowa. His name is Eli. And at first, they just don't get along. So Cabby is miserable. <laughs> she wants to get out of this job. But she can't leave because her family needs the $2 a week that she makes here. So uh, Cabby comes up with a uh, so-called brilliant inspiration, right? She's going to play matchmaker between um, her older sister, Emmeline, and the young lord of this house, uh, Nigel Ashford. Um, as you can imagine, uh, things go wrong with such a harebrained scheme as this. And I won't tell you all of what happens in the story, um, but at the end, Cabby has to learn to use her uh, intemperate tongue or her big mouth um, to stand up for her community against a, a couple of scoundrelly land grabbers, maybe including this Nigel Ashford. And she actually learns to stand up against her community in a way um, for her friend Eli, this Kiowa boy. Um, so uh, overall, I guess you could say it's it's a fun read. Um, uh, a Tale of the Prairie with lots of humor and lots of heart and just a little bit of romance. <laughs> and so I hope if you read it, you enjoy it. And uh, thank you. <laughs> a is for Afrolatia. Uh, is an ABC Darian. And I think that uh, people recognize that it. it's an alphabet book from A to Z. And what the book is and what it tries to do of, is sum up the significant African-American history that is part of the history and culture of Appalachia. Uh, and it pushes really strongly against all the stereotypes and, and negative caricatures of the region and helps celebrate it in a way that uh, surprises many people because a lot of people don't know the amazing luminaries and significant individuals in history that are connected to the region, uh, including Cheswick Bozeman, T.D. Jakes, Jesse Owens, all kinds of music superstars, starting with Nina Simone, of uh, the surprising George Clinton, of uh, Bill Withers, uh, who is well known from the region, Roberta Flack. Uh, the list just goes on and on and on. And, and what I hope people will find is a new way to think about the region in a way that really challenges 
uh, the preconceived notions most people have about Appalachia, because most definitions kind of force us away from a really broad definition that celebrates diversity, uh, particularly historically uh, and culturally. And that just isn't true in this book in a very beautiful, uh, simplistic, artistic way illustrates that, thanks to the amazing artists up from some dirt who made these words come to life. Well, uh, my book, Nowhere Better Than Here, I say always, is a love letter to Louisiana. It is set in South Louisiana, coastal Louisiana, and it is about coastal erosion um, and stories and community small towns in Louisiana. And it was, um, well, I always wanted to write a coastal erosion book because so many people don't know about what's going on in Louisiana. Um, and my, I have two critique partners, and one of them um, who lives in Atlanta, read an early draft, and she said that she kept Googling everything in my book because she could not believe she had never heard of any of this that I was talking about, and she wanted to see if it was true or if I was making it up. So I always wanted to write the story, but it's very difficult um, to enter a story where your character, my character is 13 years old, is learning about coastal erosion because it's a slow process. So why all of a sudden is it making this difference in her life? Why this impetus? And so um, it wasn't until the 2016 flood that I sort of had an entry for this book. So this book is also based on the 2016 flood that we had here um, in the Baton Rouge area where places flooded that were never gonna flood. Um, as a teacher, I also taught displaced students and um, my main character, Jillian, is a displaced student. So all of those things, um, came into play when I was when I was teaching. And during this flood, a lot of our sports teams and just students came together to help people got their homes to get them supplies. I have just witnessed and experienced the communities of Louisiana coming together to help each other time and time again. And I think Louisiana often makes the news for things that we wish we wouldn't make the news for, um, but we don't often make the news for the things that we get right. And I think that community coming together and helping each other is one of those things that we really get right. Um, so this story is about Jillian, who's a 13 year old girl who loves her small town of Bhutan more than anything. And she lives with her mom and her grandmother and they flood. Um, and it's not a storm, just like our 2016 flood. It's not a hurricane. It's just a lot of rain and her school floods and she is, is displaced. And so she begins to fight to reopen her school. And as she does, she learns more about coastal erosion and that her town is going underwater and that the state is not going to fund any more road or bridge projects because it's sort of a lost cause. And so she begins to fight that and she records a lot of oral histories because she knows that those are gonna be lost as the community scatters. And so um, I felt really excited that I got to show the beautiful landscape. I'm a big setting person. I love writing and reading uh, setting. So I got to show the beautiful landscape and the beautiful community and then just the, the wealth of stories that we have here in Louisiana as well. I've come to Mississippi for years and um, have many friends in Mississippi who were part of the American Civil Rights Movement. In 2018, as part of the 50th year commemoration of the assassination of Dr. King, I had the honor of taking a multi-faith group of individuals from Dallas through the Deep South. But for the first time of these many pilgrimages that I've led, there were several young people who were part of this pilgrimage, including our then three children. And Liberty at the time was about five years old. And so I was a little concerned about how she might take in some of the more graphic aspects of that history and still uh, allow her to come along with uh, a dear young man, the uh, son of one of my dear friends and brothers, Imam Omar Suleiman, uh, his youngest son, Abdullah. And amazingly, as we traveled to Memphis and to Jackson and to Glendora and to Birmingham and Selma and so many other places, I found myself uh, empowered and inspired by the observations of these young people. Matter of fact, they captured the heart of our entire group. It was their innocence and their willingness to press in and ask uh, deep yet innocent questions 
that impacted me in a way that I don't know I've ever been impacted before uh, on the many trips that I've led. And so ultimately, it gave inspiration to uh, writing this book and to share this story of civil rights and the civil rights movement through the lens of young children. So um, my book is The Rhino Suit, and The Rhino Suit is about a little girl who's so sensitive in the world um, that she is often overwhelmed. She's overwhelmed when somebody is crying. She's overwhelmed when she sees bad news. She's overwhelmed when she sees litter on the street. Um, and so she built a rhino suit for herself to keep herself safe from all these feelings. And um, she quickly learns that it also blocks out, you know, the wind and the smell of the flowers. And like, she can't feel it when her mom hugs her. So she learns to take the rhino suit off. Um, and this, this book is inspired because I was a very sensitive little girl. And um, I feel like I was told a lot to toughen up and get a thicker skin. So the like metaphor of like an, a thicker skin was like, it came to me pretty easily with like the imagination of a little girl thinking like, if I could only have a thicker skin, because how often have I thought that um, of, you know, you know, if I, if I would never I would choose that if I could, that would be easier. But <laughs> like, this is how I'm made. And it's taken me a long time to see that it's a gift to be that way, to be really sensitive. It's also to be really open-hearted. So um, that's like, that's my little character. And she's, um, she's based on me as a little girl. And um, the way I think that this connects to Missouri is um, visually, I think you can see in the book, um, the wide open plains, um, spotted wildflowers throughout like um, I think visually there's like mounded grass like I think that visually it's very much Missouri it's always like a rural area for me um, but also sort of the I like the open-hearted heartland mentality and, and I think that that's like um, the little the little girl's spirit is maybe very Missouri you know wide open skies wide open heart like I just think that there's like something um, in Missouri that will always be you know, part of me. And, and so it's part of the little girl's world too. Well, Mary and Mary had a little plan is a little kid who does big things. And Mary had a little plan. It starts out with Mary going on a walk with her dad. Well, on this walk, they discover that there's this abandoned lot. Well, Mary gets inspired by that lot and she wants to turn it around into being something wonderful for her community. So she creates a plan. She enlists the help of her community. She enlists the help of lots of her friends. And by doing that, Mary manages to do just that and create this lot that is quite the spot that the whole community can enjoy. And I think that Mary serves as a reminder for young readers that they can make a difference in the world too. Now, I have lived in Oklahoma for more than 20 years. My husband and I have raised our children here. And over the years, I've visited countless libraries and schools. And it is such a joy to go into these places and get kids excited about reading and writing. Um, many of my books have been inspired by my time here in Oklahoma. Two in particular actually got their start at a library in Oklahoma. One of those books was called Mostly Monsterly. I had an editor from Simon & Schuster who had called me up one day and she said she was looking for a cute, young, funny Valentine's Day story about friendship. And she said, do you think you can write one? And I was thinking, no, but I said, yes. And I didn't know what to do about writing this special book for her. And when I'm in this kind of moment where I don't know what to do, oftentimes I will go to one of my favorite places and that place is the library. So I went to the library and I read every Valentine's Day picture book I could find. And I noticed something, they were mostly about cutesy things like puppies and kittens and mice. And I knew that if I was going to write a Valentine's Day picture book, I knew mine had to be as uncutesy as possible. So when I was trying to think uncutesy, the first thing that came to mind was monsters. So I got my idea for this book at Bell Isle Public Library. And the same is true for this book. This is my book called Princess in Training. One time when my kids were very young, we were at the library and I had already found the books for me. My son Mason had already found the books for him, but my daughter Julia was taking forever to find her books. Well, Mason and I sat down on this bench in the children's area and next to me was a giant book, a big heavy book about etiquette. It was a book about manners. 
while I was wait, I, while I was waiting for Julia, I was flipping through that book and I noticed the phrase princess in training. And I was like, oh, that would make a great title for a book. And so that's how I got my second book at an Oklahoma library. So libraries are great places for good inspiration. And I'm so excited that my book, I Must Betray You, is the great read from Great Places uh, for Tennessee. And the reason it is, is because I am from Tennessee. <laughs> I live in Nashville. And I Must Betray You follows the story of a 17-year-old high school boy, Christian Florescu, who is blackmailed by the Romanian secret police to become an informer for the regime. And Christian is expected to inform on his family, on his friends, on his neighbors, on his girlfriend. And he decides to turn the tables and inform on the Romanian regime. Uh, the revolution arrives in Bucharest and it begs the question, what is the cost of freedom? So I hope you enjoy the book and I'm really looking forward to the festival.